Welcome to Unit 12 on Assessment and Communication. Test booklets and presentations, criterion reference tests, standardized, progress monitoring, formative, summative, all these terms are synonymous with assessment in ELA settings. We have to also think about, though, how to communicate the results of these uh, assessments to other parties, whether that be the students, parents, teachers, and administrators alike. Our guiding question today is, which are the most valid methods for measuring writing and writing instruction in the schools, and how often should teachers and administrators actually use these assessments? I think we can all sympathize with this young fellow here, where the quote says, do I get partial credit for simply having the courage to get out of bed and face the world again today? This is how many of our students feel in the, uh, in the world of standardized tests and those that have high stakes connected to them particularly where if they don't pass that test, they don't pass that grade level. This can increase students' anxieties and fears and, and really change their perspectives on school in general. So if we were to define the word assessment, it comes from the word assessadir, which means to sit with. In assessment, one is supposed to sit with the learner. This implies that it's something we do with or for students and not to students. Assessment in education is the process of gathering that information about a pupil's proficiencies or responses to a task. So an evaluation is the sort of the grading of it, but the assessment is actually just the collection of that data. And assessments are typically organized into four types. In the second column, you'll see universal screeners, progress monitoring assessments, diagnostic ones, or even outcome assessments that are summative in nature. And so there's specific characteristics and uses for each of these assessments. And I encourage you to look, investigate and look closer in terms of what tests in ELA are used as universal screeners, like the Yop Singer for phoneme, uh, uh, phoneme segmentation, or for progress monitoring, what do we use, right? Uh, other ones are more diagnostic in nature that dig deeper into what sort of issue or strength a student is, is um, experiencing. And then the summative ones are particularly useful when it comes to standardized assessments that we can then see how that student uh, that student's performance relates to, a, you know, in comparison and relative to other students' performance nationwide. And then we can go back and look at that assessment data to see where we might improve our um, pedagogical instruction uh, in, with respect to particular areas from a deconstruction process of those test results. The state of assessment today is really a wealth of research, but a poverty of practice. So we can have all the knowledge of effective practices, but until we actually implement those according to the student's needs, it's simply talk. And so we need to shift from teaching to considerations of learning. And what, what can students, how can students be positioned to learn and not just what are best practices outright? And this really goes into how do we train or educate pre-service and end teachers today? And I think going back to the, there's some confusions around those terms as I was talking about from assessment or the data collection and, ev and evaluation or the analysis of that data. So again, formative and summative assessments are interconnected. However, they're not always employed that way effectively within schools. And the vast majority of genuine formative assessments are informal, right, where they're interactive, timely feedback is provided and there are responses back from the students. So it creates a conversation. So for example, let's say you're scaffolding a student in their writing sample <clears throat> during that process. Um, they're going to make lots of changes back and forth with you before they are summatively graded once the piece is finished. And it's widely and empirically argued that formative assessment has the greatest impact on learning. For example, do you really, if you're, if you're scaffolding somebody's writing of an eight-page essay, the learning is going to occur in the process of it and not after the fact that it's written. And so there are some values and attitudes about assessments that we must reflect upon. The first is teachers must value and believe in their students and believe in their capacity and their capabilities to learn, to become better writers. The sharing learning goals with the students explicitly is a best practice, knowing what you expect of them and how to get to that end 
is important to vocalize. Involving students in self-assessment so that they can identify their areas of need and their areas of strength. And providing feedback that helps students recognize their next steps. So it's not just to say, hey, you need to revise this paper, but you need to do X, Y, and Z in order to revise it properly. And that's what it means to scaffold a learner forward. Also being confident that every student can improve, regardless of race, creed, gender, ethnicity, etc. And providing students with examples of what we expect with them or from them. And that, you know, defeats all other, it really trumps all other mentalities. If you're confident that every student can achieve and improve and you provide the students with examples and model exemplars of how to get there, then they can make progress. One type of assessment is assessment for learning. This is taken at various intervals. This is also known as progress monitoring, where it helps improve the quality of student learning and the quality of the course itself so that they can maximize and reach their potential. The learner-centered, teacher-directed, mutually beneficial, formative, context-specific, ongoing, and firmly rooted in ground practice assessment, that's the kind that provides information on what an individual student needs, right? To practice, to improve upon, to learn next. So it's a very methodical process. And this teacher says that she didn't have the time to be able to teach all the content. So she says, class, I've got a lot of material to cover to save time. I won't be using vowels today. So now I'm just going to begin, please turn to 122. And this is the, the quagmire that teachers find themselves in today, where there's so much to teach in a small period of time, and they feel like going deep within a content and having reviews that are necessary to improve students' process in their writing is greatly stymied given all the uh, expectations that teachers have to cover a, a bevy of content and curricula. But instead of teaching for breadth, we know that teaching for depth is always necessary and always a superior practice. The key elements of formative assessment that we must remember start with the identification by teachers and learners of learning goals and making those specific having rich conversations, which we've talked about previously, that go deep and they build upon what they already know. And the provision of effective, timely feedback, not just a red pen, but a purple or a blue or a black pen that shows, I'm in it with you. Let's do this together. The active involvement of students in their own learning, right? Passing the torch and the responsibility to them. That onus must go to them because our ultimate goal is to create a lifelong learner and a lifelong per, uh, a person who has a lifelong quest to learn and to be successful. And teachers must respond to these needs and strengths by providing particular instructional practices. And when you don't know enough, you must not be fearful of asking questions of more experienced teachers or your professors or you know, other experts alike. When it comes to summative assessment or the assessment of learning, those are the most traditional ways of evaluating student work. However, this is greatly differed from formative where it's during the process or assessment for learning, generally taken by students at the end of the unit or semester to demonstrate the sum of what they have learned. And good summative assessments are tests or other graded evaluations that must be reliable, valid and free of bias when at all possible. And so this slide really demonstrates the differences between formative and summative. Whereas in formative, we have the means are no more than the assessment is carried out frequently and planned at the same time as teaching. Whereas summative, it's increasingly used as the sum of their learning. Back in formative, we have provides feedback, which leads to students recognizing the gap and closing that gap whereas summative looks at past achievements and evaluates that as the sum total. And formative has both feedback and self-monitoring and essentially used to provide that information within the teaching and learning process. So again, each has their own merit, but we know that in the long run, formative assessments are much more valuable. And if we think through an analogy, as uh, you know, in positioning adolescents as plants. We can say that summative assessment of the plants is the process by simply measuring them. 
It might be interesting to compare and analyze measurements, but in themselves, this does not affect the growth of the plant. Whereas the formative assessment is the equivalent of feeding and watering the plants, providing nourishment that directly affects their growth. So similar to this growth concept, we have to think about the opposite and what inhibits assessment. And that is teachers who assess for quantity in the presentation of the work rather than quality alone. Right? Did you write 500 words? Did you present it within 10 minutes of time? This is important, but not near as important as the quality of the piece. The greater attention given to marking and grading, much of it tending to lower self-esteem of students, provides advice for improvement. So we need to ensure that it provides the advice and not just meant to sort of demean a student with their inabilities to write proficiently. And a strong emphasis must be given to, um, to a student's worth and not necessarily just as this attests to comparing students with one another to demoralize them. We know that true assessment that's genuine and helpful goes beyond that. So if we were to evaluate our own assessment practices on these continuums, where do we place the emphasis? Is it more on the quality of work or the quality of learning? Is it more according to marking and grading or providing advice for improvement? Is it more for comparing students or identifying individual progress? So of course it depends upon the task at hand, but nevertheless we need to always consider these ideas of how to improve learning and not just you got an A, B, C on the assignment. This biology teacher says, class, who can tell me what I preserved in this jar? No. It's not a pig or a baby cow. It's the last student who got caught cheating on one of my tests. So even though this is a whimsical uh, sort of, you know, playful cartoon, it really talks about how this teacher um, was not going to stand for anybody cheating on his test. So, of course, when we think about assessment and students start fearing that, they think of any kind of way that they can, you know, move beyond and be successful in that means. But instead of having that trepidation, we can encourage them to just simply see assessments as a way to show off everything that they learned. And other forms of summative assessment include portfolios, the traditional tests we already know about, but also performance assessment, a presentation, a demonstration, a reader's theater, those sorts of things. And so all of these have implications for classroom practice, where sharing learning goals, as we said, is an important strategy also involving the students and providing timely feedback and also being confident that every student can indeed improve their writing proficiency. And I'll end with this cartoon here where it says, in an increasingly complex world, sometimes old questions require new answers. And so when we think about assessment in the digital age, we must continue to push the envelope and see how we can firmly find out and correctly really see what students are capable of and then providing them information in order to improve those writing proficiencies that they have in order to reach their optimal potential.